All right. Good morning, Helsinki. Uh, I think the light show this morning gave the Beijing Olympics uh, a run for their money. Uh, I'm going to try that as a cure for, for jet lag moving forward. Um, so we're here to talk about the future of work, a topic that I imagine is already starting to get tired. So rather than just talking about a set of tools that are going to help people collaborate for remote teams, we're actually going to talk about what's going to happen a decade out. What will the future look like for an information worker in 2030? So I'm very fortunate to have two founders here who are going to help shape that future. So Sophie Edelman, as you heard from White Hat, who is helping prepare individuals for this future of work outside of traditional institutions. And I learned also her connection to Finland. Her husband is half Finnish. There we are. Um, and very happy to have Kari here as well. I realize I've been mispronouncing his name when I heard him introduced <laughs> earlier, just a few moments ago. Um, uh, who is the co-founder and CEO of Linear, uh, also natively Finn, and so happy to be, he was one of the seed people involved in Slush in the early days, so happy to have him back here on stage. And he's helping think through how future com companies will build software in the future at his company, Linear. So this is a topic that's very near and dear to my heart personally, not only being involved with a company like Slack, building tools for the future of work, but also in my past life when I worked at the White House during the Obama administration at the Nas National Economic Council, where we were thinking about how, where the quality jobs will be in the future um, and how to train people for those jobs. So um, I want to talk today about the trends that will be impacting workers in 2030. So the first question I have for Sophie and Kari is, what is the most contrarian idea you hold about the future of work? And Sophie, let's start with you. I think the, the most contrarian idea is really that university as a model is broken. Um, we have this expectation now that everybody who wants to be successful goes to university, but that university is actually not preparing people for the future of work. People go to university now, I think, to get a credential. It's seen as a rite of passage. But it doesn't really give people the skills necessarily to be successful in the workplace. And a lot of companies are finding they're still needing to train people um, once they actually hit the desk. So I think there's a mismatch there between what university is expected to do and what it actually does. It really acts as a passporting mechanism for people into work. And it provides a lot, whole host of other things besides. But if you don't want to go down an academic path, it doesn't seem to provide the skills you need to be successful. So are you saying that in 2030, fewer people will actually go to university? We're already starting to see that trend. So I definitely believe that you know, right now in the UK, you're starting to see 50% of people going to university. In the US, it's about 70% go to university or community college. Um, we're expecting that by 2030, that trend will see about 35% of people doing more of a work-based training. Um, rather than going to university, and, and we expect that to that trend to start really accelerating over the next few years. You're starting to see that with the applications to the elite MBA program starting to fall over the last couple of years. So people are starting to recognise that the cost of university is not necessarily leading to the uh, the return on investment that they're expecting there. And how about you, Kari? Most contrarian idea? <clears throat> yeah. So sorry, uh, so it's loud. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so I think like for me, uh, I think the con most contrarian idea is, and maybe it's just also my hope, that the, the, the way we see offices and working at offices will not exist anymore. Um, I think like it feels like the office should be the place where you do your best work. And I think rarely it's the case anymore. People actually feel like they, they don't have the time to do the work they want to do. They spend time on all kinds of other things that are are not as important that they like for their jobs. So I think like we actually I would hope to see that the model changes either towards more distributed or remote work situations or that the office environment changes so it's more like a workspace rather than what it is today. Um, so more like a crafting place or like almost like an art atelier or something where you make the things you want rather than like you spend time in meetings. So you think there will be less offices and more creative spaces in 2030? Yeah, and I think it also like smaller offices. So I think like these huge offices, uh, what ends up happening is like the company ends up growing, you have a huge office, then you now are in different floors and eventually you can get to different buildings and then the, the buildings get distributed to different campuses and then eventually you're already like working in this remote way from other people. You're not actually 
necessarily meeting the people, but you're still going to the office all the time. So I, it, it feels to me that it, what I would prefer is, is, is a place that it's a smaller place and I can work with people who are um, maybe have a similar tendencies than I do. Like it's more like we are all building stuff and we, we try to like have the focus around that. So it's more maybe workspaces or co-working spaces around like different crafts or, or, or different friends or different groups rather than like going to a company office. Fascinating. So fewer students going to university and then people meeting up who are not just with others in their company, but people who share certain preferences or attributes and the types of things they want to create. Good. Good contrarian start. Um, so Sophie, looking a decade out, um, what will be different about how individuals prepare for their careers from how they think about it today? So if you think about today, there's this expectation that um, you finish school, and then you go and have this single shot of education at the beginning of your career. You might do three years, you might do five years. Um, you get this kind of academic credential and that passports you into your, your career and then it's kind of a linear experience. But that's not actually the reality of how things work today. People study really random things. I studied geography at university. I, I definitely don't use um, formation of Oxbow Lakes in running a business. Um, but that, that experience really gave me a, a lot of things um, it gave me access to a community, a network that's been really valuable in finding my first job and, and getting on in my career. It's provided me friends and relationships that have been super valuable. Um, and it's also, it also helped me think more broadly about the world. But those things are not unique to university. Um, and if you can replicate that in um, an apprenticeship system, which is what we're trying to build, an outstanding alternative to university, by bringing people together um, from outside of their workplace and giving them training that's really applicable to their job and gives them the skills to be successful in their career, then you can really create this alternative pathway. So in 10 years time, we really, I really expect that a lot of people will forgo the university route um, if they don't want to go down an academic path. And you'll end up with um, pathways that are equally prestigious where people can go and either do um, training whilst they're working or academic learning, and you can move between them. They're seen as you know, equally prestigious. And you talked a little bit about how, how individuals will change their training, and what will change from a company's perspective about how they're going to identify talent. You've kind of talked about forgotten talent and who's not being captured by the current model. I mean, I think we talked a little bit of this. One of my favorite things about the SAT in the U.S. was by having these kind of standardized tests, you could get people outside of the boarding, elite boarding schools on the East Coast and a broader population. And you could actually test them for aptitude and give them access to universities. So how do you think kind of companies will interview in the future? So it's, companies are already starting to remove the academic requirement for entry into jobs. So I think that's a, a really positive step forward. So you're seeing Google and a lot of the big four accountancy firms um, and people like um, publishing houses actually t say academic um, success does not correlate with, with work performance. We, we're seeing that again and again. And in fact, um, some of the big four accountancy firms ran studies on their apprenticeship scheme performance versus their graduate scheme performance. Not only did they find that their apprentices were more loyal and therefore retained longer, but they actually outperformed in the job and on the uh, professional exam. So we're starting to see real evidence of that. Um, for companies, what they're starting to do is look at competencies that indicate success. So they're looking for evidence of resilience, conscientiousness, interpersonal skills. They're looking for motivation and intent. These are all things that you can measure from somebody's prior experience without looking at, at their academics. And to your point, I think one of the biggest determinants of somebody's success right now in terms of getting into elite universities and then ultimately in their life is their parents' wealth. Um, if, you, if you come from a, a wealthier family, you live in a wealthier neighborhood, you're more likely to attend better schools. Um, I know in Finland you have fantastic free schools, but um, you know, in a lot of countries, the UK and the US particularly, there's a real differentiation between different schools. Mm. And what I think we're, we're seeing increasingly is that you need to rebase people's academic performance against their school performance. You've got to look for academic outperformers, people who have both have personal drive but also ability that's not reflective of the situation they've started at in life. And that's good for companies, right? Because every company out there is trying to now hire for diversity, whether that's through ethnicity or gender or socioeconomic diversity. And the only way you can do that is by fishing in a different pool. 
Yeah, I mean, it's actually a very creative solution to inequality. I mean, you referenced this, and I know in the U.S. it's true that a parent's income is becoming a stronger predictor of their child's income, the greatest mm -hmm. data point to prove inequality. But kind of what you're talking about will obviously broaden the set of people who will get access to jobs and potentially the best policy measure um, to respond to growing inequality all over the world. Um, see, I get to policy very quickly. Uh, Kari, you've worked at some of the greatest companies or new companies out there at Airbnb and Coinbase and have said that the joy seemed to have disappeared from some of the work, even at these innovative startups. So what is really broken and how could that be different in, in 10 years? Yeah, I think like connecting back to what I said earlier about like the office as an environment, it hasn't really changed a lot in the last, I don't know, 50 years. I think like, yes, we have computers, but, but overall it's like the still same model. And I think like what's now happened when the companies have been scaling even faster, what happens is that there's not enough time maybe to, to build that kind of like the systems or the structures that the company needs. Um, so what ends up happening is that like people have to like figure those things out on the fly often, which then means that, that like, generally like, in the work, if you, whatever professional you are, maybe you're a designer or engineer or, or a marketer or a salesperson, like, a lot of your time goes to go to this like, basically coordination alignment with, between the different people in a company. And I feel like a lot of people are feeling frustrated that they actually have a great ideas to what to do, they could also execute with them like those ideas really well, but they can't because they don't have the time because most of their time goes into this kind of meta work, which is just like talking about what are we going to do rather than doing it. Um, so I think like that, I think a lot of people are starting to feel that kind of like frustration that I'm actually not feeling that this work is meaningful for me because like I actually like I'm not seeing the outputs of the work. Um, so I think like there, what we, and like what also in, in my company, what we are trying to like figure out, try to really be thoughtful about that. Like how can we structure the company so that, that it's clear how the project should be run and, and that like it's, it's effective. Um, back at the Airbnb and, and with this other, also at Coinbase, that the main way for me to be successful with the projects was actually kind of push back on a lot of things and say that no, I'm not going to come to this meeting <laughs> and I'm, I'm going to decline or ask people, do we really need 10 people in this meeting? That, or that if there's 10, 10 stakeholders for this project, I don't think there should be. I think there, any project should have like one stakeholder or maybe two. But if there's 10 people that are deciding about the project, so I think that it's not like either none of them are stakeholders or one of them is. But it's, it's like, I think usually what happens is that every, every one of those 10 people will have a slightly different opinion, and then that will like just kind of mess up with the project and the, and the schedule. And do you think that will change by behavior change of people like you coming into organizations and saying, no more meetings, or will it be the tools that people use? Like, how will we get to the kind of more efficient state in the future? Yeah, I think like there needs to be some kind of change on overall like how we think about these things. Um, which is to channel like how do we like I think like companies could be more observant on a way that they operate. Um, I mean it's it's like a lot of I think a lot of things are somewhat obvious that like how they could operate better. I think the hard part is actually like people know like yes we should have less meetings, but it's hard to enforce or it's hard to hard to like systemize. So so what some of the things what we're doing is we we're trying to figure out some of those best ways like how what are the best ways to actually build software and like run the team so it's like efficient and people feel actually that they, they feel meaningful, that the work is meaningful to them. Um, but I think like the way to do it is that it's to build this kind of like a platform or like a system that helps the companies and the management run the process rather than them running it themselves. So I think a lot of the management today is about you go to talk to this person and then you talk to this person and this person you repeat the same things to everyone. And that's what every like, management, like CEOs have to do. You just have to repeat everything, um, which I think it could be much better if you have a system that, okay, we want to change the priorities. I put it into this system. Now it will kind of deploy to the organization. Or we want to say that, okay, now projects should be actually focusing on this metric or this goal. 
Um, okay. Oh, now it's the, the rain. Future, the future has arrived. Yeah. <laughs> um, anyway, so, so, the, so the project should focus on this goal. I can like set it up into the system and then it will automatically like, deploy to all people who are working on projects and like any new project that will be started will use that as, a, as the template. So. Got it. And back, Sophie, to you to talk about individuals. That, how will the career trajectory be different for Gen Z? Will I have one job? Will I have multiple jobs? You mentioned a little bit the difference about an, not an educational chapter and then a work chapter. What will it look like for that generation? Right. I, th I think we're already seeing that chen trend with the, with the millennial generation, right? People don't go in and have one job. Uh, they don't have one career path. They switch you know, every two to four years, and, and people need constant retraining. I think the pace of change is so fast now um, with new technologies coming in that, that everyone always needs to upskill. Everyone always needs to be changing um, career paths and changing their skill sets. So I actually think we'll, we'll have a system where people um, will always be learning, will always be applying those skills. So in fact, everyone will be going through effectively an apprenticeship, whether it's a, a formal apprenticeship or not, whether that's in a digital tech or professional service career or in sort of more the traditional trades. I think that's the, the system that we're moving towards. Um, and um, I definitely I think that the, for the Gen Z or Gen Z, um, they expect much more career fluidity. We're seeing that they expect fluidity in everything, right? Their identity, whether that's gender or, or anything else, they think about themselves in a much more fluid way. And they also expect that with their career. They, they question why they can't move from being a digital marketer to being a software engineer to being a manager. Like, why can't they make these moves through their, their career? And uh, I think the answer is they can. Um, but interestingly, because they are also the generation that grew up during the financial crisis, uh, they also crave stability. So it's a funny, you know, tension there between identity fluidity and wanting career fluidity and stability. And I think companies that can embrace that give people the opportunity to stay within an organization, keep that stability of, 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 of company, but give them fluidity in terms of their career path by seeing potential harnessing that potential, giving, investing in them with training will actually reap huge um, dividends from, from their employees. So I think we're seeing a world where people may stay longer with a company but move more fluid, fluidly between different roles and have that constant training um, on an ongoing basis. And what's exciting to me with the young people we work with at White Hat is um, we work primarily with people who are at the start of their career, people who are leaving school 16, 17, 18 to sort of 24, 25. And they're starting their, their career path um, with this experience of, of simultaneous work and training. So they're learning knowledge, skills, and behavior. They're not going just doing an online course. They're embedding those skills that they're learning in their work. And so they, they've never experienced anything different. They don't think of work and education as being separate. They expect to constantly be learning. Um, and I think if you embed that early, that's actually a fundamental shift in the system. And do you think it'll be apprenticeships, at least as they are today, as one chapter? Do you imagine someone will be doing multiple apprenticeships as they pivot throughout their career? Right, we already see that. Um, I, I think apprenticeships are not limited to people at the beginning of their career, and you will do these um, consecutive apprenticeships throughout your career. So, for example, somebody might start um, doing a digital marketing apprenticeship for, for a couple of years. They build deep skills in that area, but they realize that increasingly they're using data. I mean, everything involves data these days, and being able to manipulate and crunch that data is becoming more and more challenging. So, then they would progress on to, say, doing data science and doing a data science apprenticeship, and they would become the expert in their team who can use Python and R and do regression analysis. And then they take on a team, and they need to have management skills, and so they'll go through a management training process. Rather than being shipped off for two years to do an MBA program, they'll actually spend the time learning the skills, applying those skills, reflecting on those skills, and, and fundamentally building their businesses to be better businesses. I think the companies that embrace that will end up being much more productive and much more successful because investing in your employees and developing them is the best and cheapest way to create more a shareholder value. Thank you. And Kari, I think there are going to be a lot of people who will want to be apprentices to you and how to build a more efficient kind of business. So can you talk a little bit about how at Linear you're working asynchronously and you get to build it as a founder kind of from the ground up. So how are you implementing some of this, what the future of business should be like at Linear? 
Yeah, so, so yeah, like uh, we, even with the founding team now, like we are now distributed between uh, San Francisco, New York, and Helsinki. <laughs> uh, so that's already like a 10 hour time zone difference. And, and that's, that's like, I think the main thing that people sometimes forget about remote work is that the time zones is the real problem. It's like there's no fix to it, really. I mean, people could switch their, how they sleep and are awake, but that's really hard. But so what, it, what ends, needs to happen is to, the only way to solve that problem is to try to move more of the work into asynchronous so that I think, for example, like rather than have a meeting, like make a decision, like write a document, talk about it on the document, then maybe have a meeting if it's needed. Um, and I think like this is already, I think we also, again, like we know probably going to meetings, it's often they are not productive if people don't prepare for it. Mm -hmm. um, like for example, Amazon, they use this a memo that you have to write before the meeting, and then half of the meeting is actually reading the memo in, in silence, yep. and so that everyone is informed the same way and as much as everyone else. Um, and so I think like what we, we are also trying to, obviously we need to figure out, no one has really figured out what it looks like. Uh, so what we do is, is we actually do, do those calls um, a few times a week just to stay in touch. But overall, we set up the roadmap. We, um, we obviously talk to a lot of our customers like what, it, what they need. We set up some kind of roadmap. We talk about the roadmap. Um, and then basically every, every month or so, we, we look at is, is this still the right way or is this, this, this still the right priorities uh, for the projects. We, someone owns the project and can write like a brief about it, like, okay, this is the project. And then we can like asynchronously like chat about it. Um, and then each week we will just like decide like the, that week's priorities uh, in, in one, basically we do it in our tool, we do it before the meeting um, or b before the call. And in the call we can just like see if we just like, if everything is okay, everyone is aligned. Rest of the week we don't have to talk about it or like obviously we do. But it's, it's like everyone knows, like, this is the plan for this, like, 90 days. This is the plan for the next 30 days. This is the plan for the next seven days. Um, and so that's one way to, to kind of, I think, what ends up happening in a lot of companies, it's like people are really reactive. And I think that they're changing priorities every day. And I think you shouldn't be changing priorities every day <laughs> unless something is really on fire. And then you should fix that. But, but other, other than that, like if, you're mind, if you change your mind every day, it's like you're not going to make a lot of progress. It's basically like if you're trying to sail somewhere, you're like, you shouldn't oversteer. Like you need to like decide this is the path I'm going to go. And then you adjust it every now and then. But if you keep oversteering, you're going to lose speed. So I think like that's, I think, is, is the tendency that we want, want to avoid. That can we build the company so that we, we don't oversteer every day where we are going, but we can have a reasonable uh, timeframes for, for things. This is what's fun to have a designer talking about how to manage a uh, very systems-like approach. I guess what, to each of you, what are you and your companies doing today that you think will be a trend that will extend kind of beyond tech to other sectors uh, kind of over the next few years? How are you setting the example? So it's interesting that Kari was talking about sort of dog fooding his own tool. We definitely dog food our own uh, apprenticeships at White Hat. We have a lot of uh, apprentices on our team, and I think it's uh, at different levels. To your point about people going through it at different ages um, and different po points in their career, we're already seeing that. Um, we, over the next few years, expect people to really start embracing this trend of, of investing in their people, um, investing in their training and development, putting them on these structured programs. Um, we work, we work with tech companies, for sure. Um, the Googles, the Facebooks, um, Improbables of the world, they take on apprentices. Um, and I think it's a great way for them to start bringing in new ideas into their businesses and, and really competent people. But um, we also are working with, with companies that you wouldn't expect um, outside, who are, are also pioneering. So the BPs, the, um, the, you know, the publicist, media, some of the big... Um, music companies like Warner Music and Warner Brothers, the, the law firms like Clifford Chance, they're all embracing this trend of, okay, the world is changing, the world has changed, university doesn't provide us with the skills we need um, for, for people, we're still having to train them. So let's actually 
look at this again. How are we going to make our team reflect our customer base? How are we meant, going to find the best and the brightest and the most ambitious people? And they're really changing already the way that they, they recruit, the way they retain people, and the way they train people. I think that is, that is the big trend that's going to extend beyond the tech sector. Though it's great to see some of the leading lights of tech really uh, driving that as pioneers. It's exciting to know it's multi-sector already. See, yeah. the future is always, I try to get 10 years out and it's already, these ideas are already happening. Kari, how about you? Sorry, what was that question? The question is, <laughs> what are you doing today that you think will be replicated in other kind of industries? Like, what, how is Linear implementing something that will be a part of the future? Um, I mean, yeah, I, I think like generally, like, I, I don't know, it's Linear one thing, but I, I think the software and the tech industry is, is another thing. I think overall, I think one, one of the things in, in interesting in software industry is that, and especially engineering, is like you're building your own tools all the time. So I think it hasn't really happened that much in a lot of other industries. So I think like legal or, or I mean, I think they have tools, but I think like they're not like actively thinking about it. That like how could this be better? Um, so I think like that that's like an approach that I would want to see more in different industries. Like. Should we actually like try to like figure out like what is the what is kind of like I think like the best tools also describe some kind of workflow or a system. So like if you have a company goal, so like we want to improve this thing or like generally this is the most important thing for us. Can we set up a system that incent incentivize people to do that and like or that it's actually in the tool that like this is the right way to do it. Um, and that way also I think it's it's kind help other people coming from the industry, like new, like um, re recent grads or some, someone like, or this, this uh, younger people coming to industry to understand like how things actually work. Because like you don't have to go ask this person, like how do we do these kind of things? Um, so I, think, I just think that like overall the approach of like understanding and, and trying to understand like your, what is your company's system and then what would be the right tooling to to support that or improve that, and like, do we even have a system? And in, and then like, if the and like, what if we don't? Then like, what would the system look like? So, so I think like just generally like having this like meta thinking of like, what is our company's operating system kind of, um, and then like, how how can we keep improving it all the time? Listening to you both, it occurs to me that this is all so fundamentally about talent. Mm. How do we find the best talent? How do we recruit them? How do we continue to let that talent grow? How do we build organizations to attract this kind of talent? I mean, I think one of the reasons that a lot of these companies are so good at attracting people is that they are innovating on the ways that we actually spend our time and achieve our priorities. Um, and I think, again, from the policy angle, this is an opportunity for countries to think about, you know, can we have innovative policies around work contracts? Should we have apprenticeships? Yep in the US, like how can we incentivize these remote teams to get up and running around the world instantly? I think that's a real opportunity for governments to think about how to attract kind of the best of the best from all over. So I hope everyone in the audience got a sense of what 2030 is gonna look like um, from some of the people who are building that future. So thank you both very much uh, for the conversation. Thanks, yeah, Sarah. Thank you.